I would like to introduce myself. First off, my name is Pete Monahan. I'm principal of Glenbard West High School. And I'd like to welcome um, everyone to this really important conversation uh, tonight, hosted by obviously and organized by Glenbard Parent Series. Um, this is uh, mental health is a topic. If you're in education, um, hopefully mental health and student well-being around mental health is something that's always been important to you and, and teachers, administrators, counselors all recognize that mental health plays a huge role in student learning and student growth and well-being in general. So it's a it's a immensely important topic. I'd like to welcome not only all of our um, professionals and family members associated with the four Glenbard uh, high schools, but also representatives from all of our sender schools. I know that when we host these Glenbard parent series, oftentimes we'll have um, community members from not only our community, but outside of our community. And so we'd really like to welcome all of you. As you know, Glenbard parent series is um, dedicated to serving the communities of Glenbard schools, communities beyond Glenbard schools uh, by hosting and, and having experts, authors, clinicians present on topics, all topics associated with young people, families, um, healthy living all around. And so without further, uh, without further prattling on, I guess I'd like to introduce the prime mover of Glenbard Parent Series, um, the Glenbard Student and Community Projects Coordinator, Ms. Gilda Ross. Thank you, Dr. Monahan. Appreciate it. Um, as Dr. Monahan said, we welcome always everyone to the Glenbard Parent Series. This is the 25th year of the Glenbard Parent Series. If you have not been to the website to see all of the programming that is still yet to come, I do hope you will go there. If you're a social media person, I hope you will share this resource. Everyone is always welcome, no matter where they're uh, dialing in from. So we're so happy, whether this is your 50th program or your first, um, I hope it won't be your last. So thank you so much. Uh, we're always so grateful to our sponsors. I know you saw the sponsor slide who make these programs possible. We couldn't do it without them. Uh, a few program notes. Uh, the format this evening. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you, Jerrica. Uh, this is what's coming up on January 6th at 7 p.m. We're hosting two gentlemen uh, as we learn all about inside the SAT test. Actually, the whole premise of this program is to really reassure you that this is just one of many factors that colleges look at. So we're going to hear from some experts to really reassure you that this is uh, really, this is just one very small part of the big picture. So Matthew Petrofetta from um, Acclaim Approach will be speaking. And then a special guest, Jeff Zalingo, just released a book called Who Gets In and Why? Once again, all about reassuring students and parents. Um, he'll be previewing his appearance in October of 2021, and uh, you'll get to meet both of those people. Phyllis Flagel is coming to talk about middle school matters, um, a pretty, pretty particular time uh, in a student's life, and that's on January 2nd. And then we just added a program on January 21st, a little bit of continuing this conversation. We're gonna be talking about railroad safety. We've got a very distinguished panel of uh, speakers who will be joining us. So you'll be hearing more about that um, as we go into January. Um, it's a real delight to have all of these people on the line. As I said, the format tonight, Dr. Jonathan Singer will kick us off. Um, and then we're gonna hear from some, a student voice. We've got about 10 students that are here from the Glenbards to ask their questions that they've come up with. And then we're gonna share some resources that you need to know about in your community and in, in this community as well. So um, Jonathan Singer, it's a real pleasure to welcome him back. This is a topic that we need to cover. It's not a happy topic to talk about, but we know this information is so, so very important to families. And he is our go-to resource, resource for this information. He's the author of books, Suicide in the Schools. He is a true expert. As I said, he is the president of the American Society, a suicidologist. He is a professor at Loyola University in social work. 
I couldn't be more pleased to welcome Dr. Jonathan Singer. Um, it's uh, a real honor and pleasure to be here. All right. Um, so I wanted to start out by acknowledging that, um, you know, at its core, suicide prevention is all about finding lives worth living. And if we want a world where people feel like their lives are li worth living, we can't have a society that says that some lives are worth more than others. And this is a really important take home point because we never know which folks in our community um, feel like their lives are worth more than others or rather worth less than others. And so this speaks to an individual a neighborhood, a community, and a societal level expectation that we should all have that we are building an equitable and just society. Now, I wanted to share one stat around youth suicide. Uh, this is the only stat that I'm going to share, and that is that um, uh, there are problems that seem to co occur with su youth suicide that are totally in the control of the adults in the room. Um, there's school problems, arguments or conflicts, intimate partner problems, family relationship problems. These are found in 20 to 25 percent of youth suicides. Um, the, uh, the only one that has more is where you have crises. And obviously that makes sense since uh, suicidal crisis is in and of itself a crisis event. Um, but this is an important thing for parents and, 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 and school professionals to know. We have skills, <laughs> we have resources to be able to address um, these issues that are uh, present in 20 to 25 percent of youth deaths. Um, there are many different ways that we can think about youth suicide prevention. Um, there is the prevention itself, what we do in schools, what we do in our um, uh, you know, our athletic programs that are done in um, uh, faith communities. There's the assessment. How do we find out individually what's going on with a person? How do we intervene and develop safety plans? And then what do we do after somebody dies by suicide? And that's called postvention. But they really all center on this idea of lives worth living. And so anytime I think about suicide prevention, I'm actually thinking not just about preventing suicide. I'm thinking about what is it that we can do to help people find reasons for living and build lives worth living? Some of the warning signs for youth suicide um, are talking about or making plans for suicide, are expressing hopelessness about the future, uh, displaying severe or overwhelming emotional pain or distress. And, and anytime you have those three mixed in with the next four, it's suggestive that there might be a kid who is at risk for doing something that might end their life. So for example, withdrawing or changing social connections or situations. And, and that can include hearing from friends saying, hey, so-and-so hasn't, uh, you know, they, they're, their snap streak ended. Um, I don't see them on TikTok anymore. They're not posting. Um, uh, they're not on Instagram. They haven't they haven't uploaded a picture in a week. And somebody's like, yeah, I, I deleted all my social media accounts. Uh, recent ir increased irritability or agitation. Um, in the pandemic, this can be harder for other adults to see. This is where parents um, monitoring kids uh, are really important. Um, anger or hostility that seems out of character, out of context, and changes in sleep. Now, I have heard some people say that one of the benefits of the of the pandemic, if you can say that, is that kids are getting more sleep, maybe not in a good way because they're falling asleep in the afternoon. They're not going to bed till two in the morning, but that there is a, a sense that kids are getting a little more sleep. But anytime you have these last four in the context of these first three, such as somebody, um, a kid closes out their social media account, uh, they're getting into all sorts of arguments with people they wouldn't normally get into arguments about. And then they're talking about ending their life. These are warning signs for suicide. Now, one of the myths um, is that uh, people who are suicidal are weak. And what we know from talking with folks who are suicidal, what I know from talking with kids who are suicidal, is that they're actually incredibly strong and courageous. Um, in the moment, 
they might not feel like that but i recognize their strength and 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 the and the and the fight that they're bringing to this and i found this image online and i thought it did a great job of explaining this it says do not confuse my bad days as a sign of weakness those are actually the days i'm fighting my hardest and this is an important message for parents and kids to remember for school folks to remember and so that we can remind each other that when someone is struggling it's not that they're weak it's that they're fighting really hard it's like that saying that a warrior stands with shaky knees the idea of somebody rigid and never fearful and always sort of powerful isn't real life another myth is that if you ask someone about suicide, you'll put the idea into their head. And what we know from research and from our experience talking with folks is that asking someone about suicide is not going to make them suicidal. And so if you're talking with a friend and that friend has discontinued their social media accounts and they're arguing a lot with folks and they are saying, I don't think anybody would care if I lived or died. Don't worry about making them suicidal by asking the question. Ask the question. Ask them, have you had thoughts of ending your life? And sometimes that can be an, an awkward thing to ask, and sometimes you're not sure what you're going to do with that afterwards. But it's an important question to ask. And what we found is that asking the question actually reduces distress for those who are having thoughts of suicide. And in fact, for those not thinking about suicide, it doesn't make them suicidal. It doesn't make them want to die by suicide. Now, one of the things that's a big fear and concern, understandably, for schools um, is this idea of contagion, uh, which some of my colleagues call diffusion. And this is when you have somebody die by suicide and then someone else dies by suicide soon after and then another person and this is a phenomena that exists almost in exclusively in uh, adolescence it doesn't happen in adults even though adults are the ones that adult men are the at the highest risk for suicide in a school um, we rarely see it and when we see it we don't worry that another adult man in a school is going to die by suicide um, and so the question is, how does this happen? Why is it that you have kids who see one of their peers die by suicide and then they end up dying? And one of the possible explanations is that the, uh, the, the behavior, the suicidal behavior, is, is, isn't spread simply by one-on-one -on -one contact. Like, I knew the person and therefore um, now they're dead and so now I'm going to uh, do something to end my life. Perhaps it is also that the story of what it means that this person got to a place where they could end their life started to become a story that was shared amongst people and that kids who are very much interested in their peers' lives and their stories, their narratives, start to adopt that as their own. And so um, there's this idea that the escalation of suicide clusters is a collective process by which a community tries to make sense of an initial suicide death and in doing so they change the script from suicide being something that nobody does to something that would be an option for everyone and so the question is who's most at risk and what we found is that in fact suicide is uh, suicide risk is greatest for acquaintances of kids who have died by suicide rather than those that are the closest to that kid and the family now those acquaintances have to be kids who are already at risk for suicide but it is a sense that there is a a story that is being told about that person that is um, divorced from a lot of the pain that happens when someone dies by suicide. And in fact, a study found um, that um, we, we, we need to know what this story is in a sense that it relates to me, right? Um, if James could kill himself, and I'm just using James as a, as a, as a, as a name, then anyone could die by suicide. Um, and we know that exposure to suicide isn't in and of itself 
risky, but it might be distressing. But instead, the vulnerability to suicide increases when somebody makes meaning of the experience in such a way that suicide becomes the best option to resolve the overwhelming grief. And when people understand that death as um, painful to themselves and painful to their love to the loved ones around them, then it becomes a deterrent that that those folks are saying, I, I couldn't do this to my parents. I couldn't do this to my friends. I see how much pain this causes. And so what we want to do is we want to identify folks who have found themselves having thoughts of suicide, but didn't attempt, who didn't take that step of trying to end their life and, and figure out what is that story about? How did they get to that place of sadness and hopelessness and then come back and then share that story? And so schools shouldn't ignore suicide deaths. And I acknowledge Gilda and Glenbard for um, tackling this issue head on, um, not just today, but also in the past, um, because we want to disrupt the perpetuation of these stories that make suicide the logical endpoint for all youth, because it's not, and it shouldn't be. We should have stories where kids lead beautiful, wonderful lives, even if they don't quite understand what their reasons for living are. Now, when somebody dies, we have to acknowledge that we might have lost the same person, but our experiences of that can be very, very different. And that's one of the challenges. When a kid loses a classmate, your experience of grief will be different than your parents' experience or even some of your classmates' experiences. And that is the nature of grief, is that it varies. And that variation is one of the things that keeps communities together. Because if we were all going through exactly the same thing at the same time, then none of us would have energy to circle around those who are suffering more and lift them up. And so these differences in the way we grieve are powerful and important. So I have seven tips for parents that I stole from a psychiatrist in Palo Alto. And I love these. Um, what can we do right now to decrease the risk of suicide in our kids, particularly following a suicide death? The first one, make your teen sleep. Um, number two, talk with your teen. And I know that can be challenging sometimes when a kid's like, I don't want to talk. Um, the idea is that you're available to talk to them when they want to talk to you. You want to model a mental health treatment if you are stressed, if you are having outbursts, if you are withdrawing and your kid sees this and you're not taking care of your own mental health needs, it's going to be much harder for them to buy into your recommendation that they talk to somebody. So model mental health treatment by getting your own. Um, want the best for your child, not for your child to be the best. And I don't know where people are these days with the pandemic. I know that there's a lot of stress and anxiety around grades and, and, and uh, what school is like. Um, but particularly in these times when we're being gentle and forgiving with ourselves and our kids and each other, really acknowledging that we have to rekey and retool what we understand to be what the best thing might be for our child is right now. Um, for parents, again, it's you and your te and the teachers for your teen and not you and your teen against the teachers. Uh, I'm a parent. I've got three kids. I've got a, a teenager and, and, and two nine-year-olds, and I understand some of the stressors and frustrations with educators, especially in the time of the pandemic. And yet it's important to recognize that there is a partnership there. Now, number six, get a pet. I think almost everybody in has managed to get a pet if they didn't have one before. The pandemic puppy seems to be a real thing. And the last thing is keep calm. Parents, if your kids are freaking out and you freak out, you're just going to be adding fuel to the fire. Now for schools, it's really important to conduct universal screening, which I realize is really, really difficult in a pandemic, but just lock that away and, and do that once everybody's back. 
Um, you want to make sure you're collaborating with parents and communities, and this is a great forum for doing that. You want to aspire to zero suicides and train staff to recognize and respond to suicide risk. You also want to recognize mistakes as learning opportunities. Hopefully you are in a school where when somebody says, oh, I know this is what we were supposed to do for this good reason I didn't do it and I realized that was a mistake that 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 staff member won't be punished but rather will be um, met with a thank you and what can we do with our processes and our protocols to make sure this doesn't happen again so that we can improve and the last thing is to care for staff especially after a suicide death to make sure that their needs are being met as well as everyone else's and then for the youth don't worry about upsetting adults if you're upset let us know. It is our job to manage our own feelings. Your reasons for living might not be in your life yet. I heard a beautiful story about a man who was suicidal, made several suicide attempts as a, as a teenager, and was telling this story as a man in his early 30s. And he said, I didn't know what my reasons for living were because they weren't in my life yet. And today I've got these beautiful nieces and every day I wake up and I'm so grateful that I'm here so that I can experience them. So live your best life and recognize that your reasons for living might not be in your life yet. Don't confuse sad, angry, scared, or lonely with wanting to die. Your feelings are legitimate, but being so scared or being so angry or feeling so lonely is not the same as wanting to die. Being lonely is your way of letting letting yourself know that, hey, this is a time to reach out or let people know that I'm okay if you reach out to me to be part of. And this is similar, don't discount your experiences. Some of the experiences, experiences you have are windows into what the world could be like and some of them are mirrors to show you who you are. And then finally, all of this isn't about you. The disappointments of the pandemic, the things that you had planned, the things that your parents are no longer able to do with you or for you, the plans you had with your friends, it's not about you. It's not about you at all. And at the same time, all of the things that you're experiencing, they're 100% about you. And this is the dialectic. This is the dichotomy that can be so hard for you to hold on to and manage and can be so hard for adults to help you to manage. So I just want to acknowledge that one life lost to suicide is one life too many. And every single day I wake up and everybody should wake up every single day and say, I'm going to do everything I can today up until the very last minute to make sure this person sticks around. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I really appreciate your comments and we'll be coming back to you. Dr. Dr. Monahan, you're up next. Thank you so much, Ms. Ross. And um, the comments that, that I'm going to make really are not necessarily particular to Glenbard West, but since I know Glenbard West, that's what I'll, I'll talk about. And it really has to do with how, um, what are the supports in place at Glenbard West, at the other Glenbards that um, really play a big role in uh, maintaining student health and in promoting student health and well well-being and um first it has to do with the the people and i guess that sounds sort of simple but for us when we look to hire teachers support staff members counselors we want to make sure that um we have individuals who are student centered who really have a high degree of buy-in and commitment to the well-being of our students that has to be key because if you don't have that, um, it really makes it difficult to make sure that people are tuned into training, that people are um, aware of struggles that students have, that, that um, the adults in your building know your kids. That sounds really simple and fundamental, but it's very, very important that your counselors and your staff members, your teachers know who your kids are, know their backgrounds, ask them questions. Um, Students in your building need to have a strong sense that your building is personalized. 
that there's always someone that they can go to, a trusted adult. We've heard that expression before, who, um, you know, maybe they're not comfortable talking to, uh, you know, the math teacher, but, you know, I, I seem to get along well with my social studies teacher or counselor or dean or, or whoever. So I guess that that's something that I would point out. And of course, our building has an amazing related services department. All of the Glenbards do. I know that right now we have probably most of our social workers on this presentation right now. Um, related services, for those of you who don't know, uh, is made up of our school psychologists, our social workers, our speech pathologists, headed up by our, our assistant principal for student services. In addition, we have our counseling team. Uh, our counselors are having a, having a lot of work in front of them. They're, you know, their main focus tends to be about like student schedules and helping students to uh, prepare for college, but Certainly, they are very much committed to checking in with kids. And our counselors come out in the hallways during passing periods, talk to kids. That's oftentimes the best time to reach out to kids who might be resistant. All of our schools also have problem-solving teams, what we call problem-solving teams. This is a you know divided, we divide the entire student body into these teams. And at Glenbard West, we have three of them comprised of our counselors, of our deans, of our, um, of our uh, counselors, our deans, our um, uh, social workers, they all play a, a big role in that. So um, those, things, those things are all very, very important. Um, let me just- Thank check. you, Peter. Peter, that's great. We may come back to you in a minute, okay? Let's take a break here and let's hear from some students, okay? Thank so you. Thank you, Peter. Let's go, Neil, let's start with you. Hi, uh, my name is Neil Forrest. I'm a uh, senior at North. On um, what are the most important signs to look for in teens who are possibly contemplating suicide? Uh, it's a great question, Neo. And some of the most important ones are to listen out for statements uh, that that indicate that somebody is thinking that people wouldn't care if they lived or died, that maybe the world uh, would be better off, or that their friends or their family would be better off if they were dead. Um, even really being very explicit, like, I'm going to kill myself. So often, uh, people are a little freaked out or thinking, well, that you can't be serious. Right. And so we hear those things, then we and then we say, no, 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 that that, that can't not you. Right. Um, so listening for those statements uh, and then also what I was talking about before, about making sure that if somebody is no longer part of social media. Right. Uh, it, obviously, it, during a, not during a pandemic could be, you know, quitting a soccer team or uh, not being involved in in theater activities or band or whatever it is. Um, could be a real sign that they're withdrawing. But these days it's, uh, they've deleted all their socials. And so you're like, I don't know where you went or why, but you've, you've totally withdrawn. And I wanna check in and find out. And so when you have these things in combination, uh, that's, those are real warning signs. Again, any one of these things other than the, the statements of suicide can just be, you know, I, I had to take a break for a week, right? I couldn't be on social anymore. Like that's fine. But when it's, when it happens, with some of these other things, that's problematic. But great question. Thank you, Neil. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Desiree Garcia, you're up next. Hi, my name is Desiree Gracia. Um, I'm a senior at West. And my question was, um, is there a population of high school students that are more at risk than others? Yeah, Desiree, uh, absolutely. So what the research shows um, from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is uh, through the Centers for Disease Control, is that youth who identify as bisexual um, amongst, when we think about sexual orientation, youth who identify as bisexual um, report the highest percentage of, uh, or the highest percentage of youth who, 
report suicide ideation. So almost 50% of youth that identify as bisexual reported having at least one thought of suicide in the last year. And if you compare that to youth who identify as heterosexual, that's about 14% of heterosexual youth I uh, report having thoughts of suicide. Gay or lesbian uh, youth, it's about um, uh, 38 to 42 percent. And then youth who say they're unsure of their sexual orientation, it's about 30 percent report having at least one thought of suicide. Um, we also know that uh, youth that identify as transgender or uh, gender diverse also report significantly higher uh, rates of um, suicide ideation and attempt than youth that identify as cisgender. So absolutely uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, there's a significant increase. Now important to know this is not because there is something inherently wrong with kids who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, uh, gender diverse. Uh, it has to do with the societal um, devaluing of kids who don't conform to the cis hetero um, uh, stereotype that we have. Thanks for asking. Thanks, Mr. Thank you. Patrick, so you're up next. Good evening, Dr. Singer. Uh, my name is Patrick Sajia. I'm a senior in Glen Bard East. And my question was, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected suicide rates and the availability of suicide prevention resources across our nation? Uh, it's a great question, Patris. Um, you know, I, I, I'm interviewed uh, by the news media all the time and they, they ask that same question. And here's the answer I give to them, which is that we do not have up-to-date stats on suicide risk in the United States. Uh, now, for Chicago, for Cook County, there's actually the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office has data, um, but what we but we don't know uh, what the effect of COVID has been on suicide rates um, nationally, and we certainly don't know it for for youth. Um, what I do know is that calls uh, and texts to crisis lines have increased significantly, but the the percentage of youth in particular that are reaching out to crisis lines are not reporting higher uh, percentages of, of suicidal ideation. So more kids are in crisis, but not more of them are reporting that they're having thoughts of suicide, which, I mean, it's terrible that kids are experiencing crisis, but it's good that it's not a pr proportional increase in suicide risk. Now, what it's done for resources is actually those who have access to telehealth, telemental health, teletherapy, there's actually been an increase in the number of resources that are available. So kids are able to hop online and talk to a therapist in a way that is much more accessible than it was before. And part of the reason is because insurance companies and states have uh, loosened their restrictions on who qualifies for uh, being eligible for telehealth or telemental health. And so there are various things, but um, in general, we see, uh, we, we don't know if there's an increase and we won't know until uh, two years from now, actually, whether or not the pandemic had any increase in suicide risk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. William, you are up next. While we're waiting for William, I will say that there was a uh, question in the Q&A about should the media disclose the means of suicide in public media, especially rail suicide? And the answer is no. And the reason why we know this is because there is um, uh, sort of over 50 studies that have been done that show that when news media report the location of suicide deaths, it actually creates an increase in uh, suicide deaths in those areas. Now, it doesn't make people who aren't 
previously suicidal, suicidal. But it does um, provide information and details for folks who are suicidal that seems to have um, a, a temporary increase in suicide risk. So no uh, conveying of information left in suicide notes, if there are any. Uh, no conveying uh, details about locations. Very good. And I'm glad you, you mentioned also the, uh, the availability of asking questions. So thank you for that. William, are you ready? You want to unmute? We may be having a technical difficulty. <laughs> it wouldn't so be the first back. time. <laughs> come back to William. Okay. Um, Nuha, you are next. Hi, Dr. Singer. Okay, I'm Nuha. I'm a senior at West this year. And my question for you is, uh, what is the best way to help someone if you find out they're thinking of suicide and don't want to seek help or tell someone else? Oh, Nuha, such a good question. Um, and it's such a hard question, right? Because if somebody confides in you and says, hey, I haven't really told anybody this before, but this is what's going on for me. I'm like, that's a big deal. They're trusting you. And um, I think a, a first Im impulse is to say, well, I'm not going to break that trust, right? You can count on me. At the same time, that's a lot of pressure for you to be the holder of that big secret. And so there are a couple things to do. One is to listen to them and not feel like you have to solve their problems, right? Say, hey, you're so important to me. I totally want you to stick around. I want you to stay, right? So just be honest with them, share with them, talk with them. Um, and then let them know, hey, look, this is, <laughs> this is a lot for me to hold. This is a lot for me. And I would love for you to get the help that you need and there's only so much that I can do. Um, and it would mean a lot to me if we could tell someone, right? So make it about us, we together. And if you get really like scared, if you're like, oh my God, I think they're gonna do something. Like, I, I don't know what to do. At that point, then you tell somebody, right? It, Cause it's better to have somebody mad at you than somebody dead. Right. And so you, you, you tell somebody, you tell your parents, you tell, you call a, a school counselor, you, you contact the crisis text line. You say, Hey, I'm talking with a friend of mine. She's talking about killing herself. She says she doesn't want to tell anybody. I don't know what to do. Can you help me through this? And they will help you through that. Right. So there are all of those things that you can do. Bottom line, you're probably the most important person to them in that moment. And it's an unfair position for you to be in to hold all of the stuff that's been building up in their life for possibly years. And so it's a reasonable thing for you to reach out and get help for, for you and for them um, mm -hmm. when they need it. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Uh, Devin, you are up next. Hello, my name is Devin Kelleher and I'm a junior at Glenbard West. And my question is, so current high schoolers live in a generation that is filled with people who use sarcastic humor as like a primary coping mechanism. What can we do when we aren't sure if someone is joking or not and we're having trouble getting past the supposed humor? Ooh, <laughs> Devin, yeah, okay, all right. So, um, yeah, because it's tough when somebody is always like, you know, saying KYS or KMS, right? Like, and I'm like, and you're like, okay, wait, but are you seriously going to kill yourself if you don't pass this test? Or are you like joking? And they're like, ah, and you're like, wait, wait, no, 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 really, I don't know. Um, that's a tough thing. And what I would say is that uh, at a certain point, it, you can you can say, look, I, I care about you, like you're hilarious and you're funny and... I also am not sure anymore. And I think that maybe you've got some stuff that for good reason you don't want to share it with me or is going on. And I'd really love it if you could talk to an adult about this, talk to somebody else, a therapist. Um, and, you know, I'm probably what I'm going to do is if you, if like, if, if you can't level with me, I'm just gonna let somebody know, you know, I'm talking with so-and-so, he might be joking or he might not, I'm not sure. But I'm, and, and then you say, you know, like I'm doing this just cause I care about you, right? And enough, you know, a, enough is enough in terms of a joke. Mm -hmm. That's good. 
Thank you. That, Thank that's you. Mm-hmm. Laiba Khan, you are up next. Hi, I'm Laiba Khan and I am a senior at West. And my question is, um, are there certain triggers that might help someone set themselves off? Yeah, so there are lots of different things that can be triggers. And this is one of the things that can be so tough about suicide risk is that something that is a trigger for you might not be a trigger for somebody else. And so whenever I'm talking with folks, uh, you know, kids or adults, I'm always asking them, I'm like, so like what set you off today? What was the thing that happened? Um, what do you think the thing's going to be tomorrow or the next day? And actually have them explain it to you. It's like, you know what? If my if my parents take away my phone one more time, like I'm going to lose it, right? And you're like, okay, that's good to know. Like, thank you for telling me. I always like to check in also and say, what are the ways that you let your friends know on social media that you're not doing well, Right. Are there memes? Are there memojis? Are there whatever it is? Like, how do you let your friends know so that you can be clued into that? So that if you see that, then you have an idea that something's going on. That's a perfect segue to Haley's question. Haley, you're up now. Hi, my name is Haley Knoll, and I'm a sophomore at Glenbar North High School. And my question is, what if someone seems suicidal on social media? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, uh, and people people do uh, share their suicide, their thoughts on, on social media. I mean, obviously, there are some very famous cases of people actually dying by suicide on Facebook. Um, here's what you do. The first thing you know, you, you, you let them know, Hey, I see that you're, uh, that you're in pain or you're struggling or something, right? Um, if you're on social media and for whatever reason, like you can't do this, there's always buttons where you can report, um, posts or tweets or, you know, whatever. And there's an option for the company to then do some intervention or reach out to the person and say, hey, do you want to contact Crisis Text Line or National Suicide Prevention Lifeline? Um, If you see that they are posting things and people are uh, trolling them, right? Like they're like, hey, this is, I, I can't handle this anymore. And people are like, oh yeah, well, prove it do something right you can you can you can be an uh, an upstander on social media and say hey i don't think it's cool when people are doing that i know it puts you out there right but at least at least it lets somebody know that you are with them and sometimes that can be the thing that makes all the difference because one of the fundamental experiences of being suicidal is i i i'm not important to people and when you say, no, 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 like you're important to me, then that totally changes things. So simple, Thank you. but so important. Thank you both. Aryan, you are next. Hi, Dr. Singer. I'm Aryan. I'm a junior at uh, Glenmark South. So my question is, how can we break the stigma about seeking help? Hmm. That's a good question, Ariane. So, um, I, you know, one of the reasons why there's stigma in the first place is that there's that myth that I was talking about earlier, which is like that people equate struggling with being weak or being defective or like there's something wrong with me. And what's true is that we all need some help sometimes, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, we're, we're living through a pandemic right now. Right. Like this hasn't happened in a hundred years. If somebody's struggling, right. Your friend's struggling and they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. You're like, why don't you go talk to somebody? And they're like, what? No, 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 no. I'm not that guy. You're like, dude, we're in a pandemic. 
Like, are you kidding me? Like, you can do that. You could, nobody's going to like be upset with you or think that you're weak because you're like, hey, I'm going to go reach out and get some help. Like, we don't do that when people are have, like, I have a great business idea. I'm going to go get some investors to invest in me and give me money so I can do my product, right? We think, oh, that's smart. But when somebody's like, oh, I'm struggling, I need some help with my feelings, and I go talk to the feeling mate lady, like, then suddenly that's a problem. So I think that's one of the one of the stigmas is that people think that that's it's weak it's going to be perceived as problematic and anytime we're able to have um the adults in the room say yeah of course i see a therapist or no talking to people about what's going on is exactly what we need to do or when you can do that like if you're one of the kids that people look up to and you're like yeah of course i see a therapist even that will start to um, disrupt that stigma and that shame associated with seeking help. Thank you. Sean, you are up next. Hello, my name is Sean Swigel. I'm a senior from Glenwood West. And my question is, how can we have conversations with our parents about how we are feeling without alarming them? Mm, yes. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, Sean, I'm loving the pictures of uh, Rome in the background. Um, those are awesome. Uh, the second thing is that, you know, this is this is where earlier when I was talking, you know, and I was saying, like, like let us know how you're feeling. It is our job to manage our our emotions. I know that's a tough thing. I mean, as a parent, sometimes I have a hard time when my kids are angry or sad or scared, um, but. Uh, if there's any way that you can let your parents know, look, sometimes I'm going to be upset. And really all I need for you to do is to say, I see you're upset. I'm not going to freak out. And I would like to hear more about it. Right. If there's any way you can let them know. Great. And if you can't let them know, send them to me and I will tell them. <laughs> um, Sean has this brilliant problem solving brain of his and sometimes he's really upset and he just needs to talk through some things and he just needs you to sit there and listen so that he can let it out and then he'll be able to move on with his day. Very good, thank you. William, thank you. let's see if you can get on now and unmute yourself. It's working now. We're having technical difficulties, and he has such a good question for you. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to read his question for him because he really thought this through. His question is, during high school, most students have so much to deal with on their own that it's, almost, that it's often difficult to recognize when others might be asking for help. What are some ways for us to center ourselves? What are some ways? Wait, what was the last bit? What are some ways to what? what some ways for us as students to center ourselves so we can be there for our friends. To center ourselves. Oh, that's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, centering is one of the where you are able to slow things down and start to recognize what is really going on and and we make things very complicated and as william's question said you know we're so busy like how do we do this at the end of the day there are very few things that are true one of the things that's true is how you are feeling right now in your body physically like you could be feeling hot i'm a little sweaty my back hurts a little bit those are real right um I think my friends are upset with me. Um, it's totally unfair that I'm not going to be able to, um, uh, you know, visit my grandparents over Christmas. Like these are not real. Yes, there is some sadness associated with them, but they're stories that we make up. And so centering is all about breathing and getting in touch with what is really going on with ourselves. And when we do that, it really does clear away the, the clutter. Um, so if you're able to do that, and you can sort of look around and be like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to move past all of the drama that's going on with my friends and be like, OK, what's really going on with you right now? Like, what's what's the real story here that can be incredibly powerful? Thank you. Libby, you are up next. 
Hello, my name is Libby Wallace and I'm a junior from West. And my question is, what can we do for our fellow students and friends during these challenging times? Hi, Libby. Um, I, I mean, I think one of the things that we can do for our friends uh, during these challenging times is A, be as real as we can with them. Um, and B, remember that, you know, this too shall pass, right? I mean, if we think about folks in 1918, 1920 or 1929 during the Great Depression, right? And they're freaking out and you're like, yeah, yeah you're freaking out. But in a couple of years, like these amazing things are going to happen. You just don't know it yet. Like that's going to happen for us too. I don't know what that is because I don't know the future. Um, but I do know that it is going to happen because it's happened in the past. And so I think that's one of the things that you can do for your friends is um, you can be grounded one day and be like, hey, this too shall pass. And then hopefully somebody else can be that person for you when you're freaking out and you're like, ah. So that's that would be my, my advice. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, you know what, um, Peter, did you have anything else you wanted to say before we turn it over to Diane? No, not re not really. And I didn't really mean to prattle on about all the things that Glenbard West and other schools are doing because I think it's so great that we have these kind of students that ask these questions, mm -hmm. you know. And one of the things that Dr. Singer talked about, which I think is so spot on, is the importance of listening and really being willing to be coached up by kids sometimes mm -hmm. and taking their advice and asking them questions. So. That's all I would just end with. And now I'd like to just turn it over to Ms. McGinley, who is the mayor of the village of Glen Ellen. Well, thank you, Dr. Monahan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Singer and Gilda, of course. Such an important conversation and just so educational. I've really learned a lot tonight. Um, I'm really excited to announce um, the village has formed a new mental health task force uh, that has been created for our community. And we defined community as anyone who lives, works, studies, seeks religion, or interacts with our village in any way. The uh, people, the task force that is comprised of these uh, mental health organizations are actually on here tonight. And there may be a few others that weren't able to make it, um, but what a panel of experts that we have um, that's going to bat for our town. The goals of this task force is to establish relationships with one another, to get to know each other's programs and services that they offer, promote one another's programs and create a network of support for our community. I am grateful for their eagerness and willingness to put so much effort into our community. Thank you to all. Thank you, Diane. And I, this may serve as a model. A couple of things you may hear now may be a model for your town that the vil your village would have this networking organization. And then you'll also hear about a parent who has started a similar organization. Um, I, there are a couple of questions in the chat that we will get back to as soon as we meet these people who are going to tell you a little bit about the resources. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Deanna uh, Filkins, who's going to talk about the Glen Ellen Youth and Family Counseling Service. Deanna? Hi, everyone. My name is Deanna Filkins. I'm the Executive Director and Lead Therapist at Glen Ellen Youth and Family Counseling Service. Um, we are a local nonprofit that caters to all Glen Ellen residents and anybody who attends Glen Ellen based schools. Um, we provide individual couples counseling as well as family counseling at reduced fees. So our fees go as low as $5 a session. Um, we never will not treat anybody based on their inability to pay. Everybody is welcome. Um, I also want to make mention of a parent and adolescent support group that we are currently looking for participants. Um, the support group is free of charge and it's based around just supporting families that um, may be dealing with acute or some toxic stress, uh, primarily related to the pandemic and what everybody is experiencing right now. So if you are looking for resources, please reach out. Um, you can find us on our website at geyfcs.org. Thanks. Thank you. That's wonderful to hear about. Uh, next up, we'll hear from Shannon Hartnett. She is the director of Northeast DuPage Family and Youth Services. Shannon? Hi, thank you, Gilda. Uh, again, I'm Shannon Hartnett. I'm the executive director of Northeast DuPage Family and Youth Services. We are a nonprofit community-based agency. Uh, we provide individual, family, and group counseling. 
And we also, um, similar to Glen Ellen, um, offer that service for reduced fees. Um, we don't turn anyone away for their in, you know, inability to pay. Um, we specialize really in providing um, youth counseling, youth and family counseling. We really specialize in trying to um, build the resi resilience of families to avoid contact with the juvenile justice system or with the child welfare systems. We have offices throughout DuPage County. So we probably do have an office near you. We are embedded in five different police departments. So we work in partnership with those five police departments to provide social services and mental health services to residents of all of those towns. Um, our referrals come primarily from police departments. We're also in schools. We provide a lot of uh, services actually at school or after school. Um, we also get a lot of referrals from different community-based agencies. And so um, we're really looking forward to um, expanding our services in Glen Ellen and working with this group. So thank you. Excellent. And Shannon, didn't I hear that you just received a grant to help with families in Glendale Heights as well? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Great to know about that. Thank you so much. Betsy, uh, you are up next. Betsy is a Behavioral Health Emergency Services Supervisor with the DuPage County Health Department. Betsy? Hello, everyone. As Gilda said, my name is Betsy Besh, and I am an Emergency Services Supervisor at the DuPage County Health Department. Um, I manage, um, I'm one of several supervisors at our Crisis Services Center, um, so I'm here to speak a little bit about the services that we provide there. Um, we provide 24-7 crisis services out of our location um, based in Wheaton. Um, we also have two different hotlines that we answer for crisis support. Um, we do mobile screenings out in the community. Um, we also have counselors and clinicians available um, on site for crisis support. Um, you can contact us at Crisis Services at our direct number, which is 630-627-1700. Another resource that I'd like to mention is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, and we are a provider for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That telephone number is 800-273-TALK, and TALK is actually 8255 for those of you that don't spell things out on your, on your keypads anymore. Um, the National Suicide, we are a, um, one of the service providers for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, but it is a 24-7 hotline for individuals who may be experiencing suicidal ideation or in need of mental health support. Another service um, that I wanted to um, bring up is the Crisis Text Line. Um, it, it is a 24-7 texting line um, for crisis support. And you can, in order to access those services, you can text REACH, R-E-A-C-H, to 741-741. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Betsy. And we will put uh, this resource and links to all of the or different organizations that you um, have heard from tonight. Um, next up is Cheryl Hasek. She is with the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago as the Children's Mental Health Coordinator. Cheryl? Hi, good evening, and thanks for um, inviting me to be here tonight. Um, at the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago, we are in um, Kane, DuPage County, um, as well as the city. And um, there's a lot of services that we have, but for tonight's audience, I wanna highlight just um, two of them. Um, one being our, our sexual assault services, which are free for survivors. Um, and family members of survivors of sexual um, assault. Um, and so um, that's in our Addison and, and we have other locations, but that would most likely be the closest um, for this audience. And we also have advocates. So again, um, reaching out for help and support if you have a friend um, who um, has experienced um, a sexual assault, again, the YWCA would be a great resource for you. Um, and then the other resource is the trainings that we provide um, for professionals as well as students. So um, I am certified in QPR, which is, is Question, Persuade, Refer, which is a, um, a suicide awareness and prevention program um, developed by Dr. Paul Quinette. 
And um, so again, just another opportunity in terms of suicide services and awareness that we provide at the YWCA. I just invite you to check out our website as well. We have tons of more services um, at ywcametropolitanchicago.org. Thank you, Cheryl. It was great to hear about your QPR suicide awareness that you are willing to go to organizations and religious institutions and share that information. So I, I really appreciate that so much. Um, when I mentioned the resources that you can find on our page, it's the Jonathan Singer page. Uh, right now, it will become a past event. Um, there you can also find a recording of tonight as well as two take fives that Jonathan previously recorded. It's a five minute video that you can share, the parents can share with their teens. And then the, there is a five minute video, a little synopsis of what Jonathan talked about. And that will be available, uh, for, that's for parents. So thank you for those two things. Uh, Robert Kelleher of You Will Be Found, you are up next. There it is. Hi, um, thanks. Thanks for having me and us. Um, my name's Bob Kelleher and I'm representing a group called the You Will Be Found Project. It's a brand new group that um, we've just started here in the Glen Ellen area in the last few weeks. Um, the You Will Be Found Project is a diverse group of local parents striving to improve mental health resources for the children in our community. We hope to shine a light on the epidemic of toxic mental stress, to prevent mental health crises in our children and to provide our young people with the direction they need to become adept at managing their own wellness. Um, as I've indicated, we're a brand new group. Um, we hope in early 2021 to have some um, concrete plans in place for what we're going to be doing. If anyone out in the community would like some more information or would like to um, possibly join what we're trying to do, you can email us at YWB as in boy F dot project at gmail.com. That's YWBF dot project at gmail.com. And we'll put you on our list and reach out to you. And um, we're hoping to have lots of people who can help us help the kids in our community. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. And I know you're willing to be a resource for other communities who um, are like have like-minded parents who also want to start something similar. So I appreciate your volunteer. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the one organization that couldn't be here tonight because they have a training is NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, they also are an excellent resource um, and they come to health classes in almost all of the schools in the area, including the Glenbards. So I want to acknowledge their, their good work. Uh, questions in the chat? So Gilda, I'm, um, uh, I've been answering some of the questions that are in the Q&A. Oh, um, and you can look at them in the answer. Uh, there are a couple that are open and I'm happy to answer some of those live if you would like. Uh, if you wouldn't mind taking one or two of those, because um, I know when a question comes in, it probably is indicative of the fact that there are many people. So if we could take three questions and then maybe if you, what's a qu the question that you often get from parents? on a night like this? Um, well, actually, you know, one of the questions that is uh, from uh, anonymous attendee, um, how can we educate people about the fact that sometimes there are people who don't show any signs of uh, suicide and still die by suicide? How do we support those families or friends and peers? How can we help support those individuals who may seem happy but are actually having suicidal thoughts if we don't know, if we don't know it to help prevent it? Um, so, a couple of things. One, you know, one of the reasons why I encourage schools to do universal screening, I mean, to, to survey kids, students about if they're having thoughts of suicide is because you don't know just by looking at somebody if they're suicidal. And so it's really important to be able to get that information. Um, it's another reason why I uh, say that we uh, won't make somebody suicidal by asking them the question because it's really important to be able to to ask the question of somebody. And so um, if we're not asking, we're not gonna get the answer. Now, the flip side is that uh, 
lots of research and conversations with uh, folks who have survived suicide attempts and family members have suggested that in fact most people who die by suicide have indicated that they're suicidal and so part of that is knowing what to look for knowing the warning signs and that's why i had that slide about what the warning signs are for youth suicide and they're similar for adults and sometimes they include quitting a job or giving away possessions or things like that but knowing what these are. Now, once somebody has died by suicide, then our focus becomes responding to this sense of grief and loss and, and that unanswerable question about why and what could I have done differently? And so we honor and we, we value and acknowledge those folks and their loss. Um, and we don't focus on this idea that like, well, everybody shows a warning sign because like nobody wants to that when they've lost a loved one to suicide. But there are many things that we can do. And one of the things that I really want to encourage parents to do is to say, I'm going to talk to my kids, um, friends, parents about this idea of suicide and say, what, what should we do as parents if one of our kids expresses something that is concerning, that makes us think that they might be suicidal? How do we support each other as a community? And how do we share information and how are we there for each other? So that community parenting idea, um, but focused on suicide risk. So that that's my uh, answer to that question. Um, and it sort of ties into the next question, which is recommendations for the best approach for a parent to take with a child who's lost a friend to suicide but doesn't want to talk about it. Um, I think the first thing is, not the first thing, one of the things is, again, to have kind of a community agreement. And when I say community, I mean like your community of friends, not every single person that lives in Glenbard. But you know, the, 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 the circle of friends and the parents, like what is our stance on supporting each other and supporting the kid? Um, there are lots of reasons why kids wouldn't want to talk. And if one of those reasons is because they feel like they'll be um, talked at or criticized or um, dismissed in some way to say like, oh, I know this is so hard, but you'll, you'll, you'll get over it, you'll see. Like those are all reasons why somebody might not go to an adult to talk. And if those are the reasons, then those are things that we can control and we can do something about. We can do it differently. Um, sort of like um, uh, when I was talking with, uh, when I was answering, I think it's Sean's question about how to talk to parents. Um, now, if there's another reason, like the parents are sort of doing everything right and the kid still doesn't want to talk, that can also be okay. Um, it, I don't know if it is, but it could be. There are just some times where you just need time to process and you don't want to talk about it. Um, you'd rather do something about it, right? So you want to go on a walk. You want to do an activity. You want to build something. You want to create something. Um, and that's how you would express your grief and, and sort of work through this. And so I think there are lots of different things that can happen. Um, and this is one of the reasons why it's so helpful to have grief and loss camps that kids can go to in the summer. God willing, pandemic will allow that. Um, and also to have grief and loss counselors that can uh, hold a space and create a, a space where kids are more likely to talk about that. Uh, it would be great if parents uh, and kids were able to talk about everything. Sometimes they're not able to, and that's when hopefully reaching out to professionals is useful. Um, so those are those are two questions. Gilda, do we have time for me to answer another one? Do you have one more? Let's take one more and then we'll close, Jonathan. Um, uh, let's see, this is related. So as a youth worker, how often should you ask a student directly who's lost a friend from suicide how they're doing on their grief journey? Um, so I think it's a reasonable thing to check in with folks, um, uh, but to do it in a respectful way. Right. And to do it in a way that says, um, hey, I'm thinking about you. And, you know, I know it's been a month since he died or, hey, it's been six weeks or, hey, I saw something that reminded me of so and so. And I was just thinking about you and I'm wondering how you're doing. Right. That's a very different thing than, hey, um, I, I notice you haven't talked about how you're feeling about so and so's death. Um, could you give me an update 
<laughs> right? We just very different experiences of those two ways of being with somebody. Um, and so I think that that sort of gentle check-in is something that you can do as a peer, right? So as a friend or as a youth worker, right? Um, to gently reach out and say, I'm, I'm thinking about you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, this program is, uh, you know, we don't want it to stop here. So, you know, I, I encourage you, even, even in the month of January, there is a program on January 27th. Dr. John Duffy has written a book, Parenting in the New Age of Anxiety. And he is going to be talking about his book, Parenting in the New Age of Anxiety, Understanding Your Child's Stress, Depressed, and Amazing Adolescence. That's Wednesday, January 27th. And then, as I mentioned, we've added a program on railroad safety for January 21. Um, lots of programs in the coming year. So please, uh, as you get out your new calendar, go to glenbardgps.org and look at the programming that's coming up. And then uh, please do take a look at the resources. We do record these events. Uh, can, we re can we share this recording, Jonathan? Is that okay with you? Is that all right? Yeah, of yes, course, wonderful. absolutely, yep. That's very generous. I, I really appreciate that. So you'll go to glenbardgps.org. You'll look at Jonathan's page. That's where you see the resources for all the community that we talked about tonight, um, the videos, the take fives. A special thank you to those students who were so brave to come on tonight, those uh, people uh, who are representing your resources in the community, all the professionals, the social workers in the buildings and the schools who are working so hard for our kids. Um, Jonathan Singer, um, and all of the people who listened in tonight, um, we wish you a peaceful holiday season, and we can't wait to welcome you back in January 19, in January 2021. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.